They're all dead, said Piggy. And this is an island. Nobody don't know we're here. Your dad don't know. Nobody don't know. What? Starting, Starting. Wrestling. in three, two, two. one. Okay. okay, here's the deal. Let's learn. In the year 20XX, a pandemic spread across the land. But when educational doors closed and communities practiced social distancing, CFI 70's language and literature teaching was still up for the challenge. Join Mr. Strother and his amazing quarantine! Read aloud. News articles. Comic books. Writing activities. <laughs> Greyhounds. <laughs> Kids who don't even go here. Wait, Flavored water. Dad jokes. You are now joining Mr. Strother's quarantine. The Lord of the Flies. Actually, it's not really that dark. The truth is, The Lord of the Flies is a classic piece of literature. When I was your age, I had to read it in middle school. But even though it's old, it's not that completely outdated. It has some weird terminology in it like pounds instead of dollars because it's not actually American boys, but it's still exciting to see young men surviving on an island together without adults. Who do you think would survive the longest? Now our goal when reading this is to understand the theme or the central idea. So let's talk about that real quick. Let's wrap up the state standard. Today we're going to be discussing RL 2.2, where we analyze the development of a theme or central idea over the course of a work of literature. Now in this case, we're only going to be examining the first chapter, but that's okay. We can still talk about setting and plot and character and dialogue and all those things are relevant, even if we don't read the whole thing. But if you like it, then continue on because that book's available on our website, clever.com. Now that we just discussed the state standard, let's talk about it in a little more detail. Now the theme is what the author's saying between the lines. So if on the page, those words tell the story and what's actually happening, it's discussing the main idea or the central idea. So the main idea in this first part might be that Ralph is discovering the island along with Piggy. Or you could say the central idea to this part of the story is that they're finding their footing and discovering if other people are on the island, an island they're at alone. But the theme is what the author's telling you between the lines. What is the author saying about people like Piggy? What is the author saying about people like Ralph? What is the author saying about young men when they have real freedom? And you can challenge the theme because the theme applies to everything in every book, not just this one. Sometimes it's known as the moral of the story, but other times it's just another perspective of looking at life. And one easy way to figure out if that theme can hold up on its own is to take out one of these three things either the setting, the plot, or the characters. If you pluck out the setting and you change it from this remote island to a schoolyard or New York City or your house, does it change things? Probably quite a bit. If you take the characters and you take out the competent leader and leave only the anxious dork, it changes things too. If you take the characters and the setting and you take out the plot of them being alone, well, that changes a lot too. So the theme is dependent on those three things. So as we're reading, I want you to pay attention. Why do you think the author chose these three things? And if you're writing on your own, what happens if you change the setting? What happens if you take your favorite character from another story and drop them into yours? If it changes things around, maybe that theme or that moral of the story is a little more interesting to you. So let's sit down, take a break, and explore the island with Ralph and Piggy, the Lord of the Flies. Now, if it helps you to listen to the audio and you don't have me around every day, I totally get that. So I supplied a copy of the audio book read aloud on YouTube as well. That link is right next to the text file in Clever. Lord of the Flies by William Golding, Oxford University Press. Chapter one, The Sound of the Shell. The boy with fair hair lowered himself down the last few feet of rock and began to pick his way toward the lagoon. Though he had taken off his school sweater and trailed it now from one hand, his gray shirt stuck to him and his hair was plastered to his forehead. All round him the long scar smashed into the jungle was a bath of heat. He was clamoring heavily among the creepers and broken trunks when the bird, a vision of red and yellow, flashed upwards with a witch-like cry, and this cry was echoed by another. Hi, it said. Wait a minute. The undergrowth of the side of the scar was shaken and a multitude of raindrops fell pattering. Wait a minute, the voice said. I got caught up. 
the fair boy stopped and jerked his stockings up with an automatic gesture that made the jungle seem for a moment like the home counties. The voice spoke again. I can't hardly move with all these creeper things. The owner of the voice came backing out of the undergrowth so that twigs scratched on a greasy windbreaker. The naked crooks of his knees were plump, caught and scratched by thorns. He bent down, removed the thorns carefully, and turned around. He was shorter than the fair boy and very fat. He came forward, searching out safe lodgments for his feet, and then looked up through thick spectacles. Where's the man with the megaphone? The fair boy shook his head. This is an island. At least I think it's an island. That's a reef out in the sea. Perhaps there aren't any grown-ups anywhere. The fat boy looked startled. There was that pilot, but he wasn't in the passenger tube. He was up in the cabin in front. The fair boy was peering at the reef through screwed up eyes. All them other kids, the fat boy went on. Some of them must have got out. They must have, must have, mustn't they? The fair boy began to pick his way as casually as possible toward the water. He tried to be offhand and not too obviously uninterested, but the fat boy hurried after him. Aren't there any grown-ups at all? I don't think so. The fair boy said this solemnly, but then the delight of realized ambition overcame him. In the middle of the scar, he took on his head, excuse me, he stood on his head and grinned at the reversed fat boy. No grown-ups, the fat boy thought for a moment. That pilot. The fair boy allowed his feet to come down and sat on the steamy earth. He must have flown off after he dropped us. He couldn't land here, not in a plane with wheels. We was attacked. He'll be, all, he'll be back all right. The fat boy shook his head. When we was coming down, I looked through one of them windows. I saw the other parts of the plane. There were flames coming out of it. He looked up and down the scar. And this is what the tube done. The fair boy reached out and touched the jagged edge of the trunk. For a moment, he looked interested. What happened to it, he asked. Where's it got to now? The storm dragged it out to sea. It wasn't half dangerous with all them tree trunks falling. There must have been some kids still in it. He hesitated for a moment, then spoke again. What's your name? Ralph. The fat boy waited to be asked his name in turn, but this proffer of acquaintance was not made. The fair boy called Ralph, smiled vaguely, stood up, and began to make his way once more toward the lagoon. The fat boy hung steadily at his shoulder. I expect there's a lot more of us scattered about. You haven't seen any others, have you? Ralph shook his head and increased his speed. Then he tripped over a branch and came down with a crash. The fat boy stood by him, breathing hard. <sighs> my auntie told me not to run, he explained, on account of my asthma. Asthmar? That's right. I can't catch my breath. I was, only, I was the only boy in our school that what had asthma, said the fat boy with a touch of pride. And I've been wearing specs since I was three. He took off his glasses and held them out to Ralph, blinking and smiling, and then started to wipe them against his grubby windbreaker. An expression of pain and inward concentration altered the pale contours of his face. He smeared the sweat from his cheeks and quickly adjusted the spectacles on his nose. Them fruit, he glanced round the scar. Them fruit, he said, I expect. He put on his glasses, waded away from Ra Ralph, and crouched down among the tangled foliage. I'll be out again in just a minute. Ralph disentangled himself cautiously and stole away through the branches. In a few seconds, the fat boy's grunts were behind him and he was hurrying toward the scream that still lay between him and the lagoon. He climbed over a broken trunk and was out of the jungle. The shore was fledged with palm trees. These stood or leaned or reclined against the light, and their green feathers were a hundred feet up in the air. The ground beneath them was a bank covered with coarse grass, torn everywhere by the upheavals of fallen trees, scattered with decaying coconuts and palm saplings. Behind this was the darkness of the forest proper and the open space of the scar. Ralph stood one hand against a gray trunk and screwed up his eyes against the shimmering water. Out there, perhaps a mile away, the white surf flinked on a coral reef, and beyond that the open sea was dark blue. Within the irregular arc of coral, the lagoon was still as a mountain lake. Blue of all the shades and shadowy green and purple. The beach between the palm terrace and the water was a thin bow stave, endless apparently, for to Ralph's left to Ralph's left the perspectives of palm and beach and water drew to point at infinity, and always almost invisible 
was the heat. He jumped down from the terrace. The sand was thick over his black shoes and the heat hit him. He became conscious of the weight of his clothes, kicked his shoes off fiercely and ripped off each stocking with its elastic garter in a single movement. Then he leaped back, excuse me, then he leapt back on the terrace, pulled off his shirt and stood there among the skull-like coconuts with green shadows from the palms and the forest sliding over his skin. He undid the snake clasp of his belt, lugged off his shorts and pants and stood there naked, looking at the dazzling beach in the water. He was old enough, 12 years and a few months, to have lost the prominent tummy of childhood and not old enough for adolescence to, to have made him awkward. You could see now that he might make a boxer as far as width and heaviness of shoulders went, but there was a mildness about his mouth and eyes that proclaimed no devil. He patted the palm trunk softly and forced at last to believe in the reality of the island, laughed delightedly again and stood on his head. He turned neatly onto his feet, jumped down to the beach, knelt and swept a double armful of sand into a pile against his chest. Then he sat back and looked at the water with bright, excited eyes. Ralph, the fat boy lowered himself over the terrace and sat down carefully, using the edge as a seat. I'm sorry I've been such a time. Them fruit. He wiped his glasses and adjusted them on his button. Excuse me, on his button nose. The frame had made a deep pink V on the bridge. He looked critically at Ralph's golden body and then down at his own clothes. He laid a hand on the end of a zipper that extended down his chest. My auntie. Then he opened the zipper with decision and pulled the whole windbreaker over his head. There! Ralph looked at him sidelong and said nothing. I expect we'll, we'll want to know all their names, said the fat boy, and make a list. We ought to have a meeting. Ralph did not take the hint, so the fat boy was forced to continue. I don't care what they call me, he said confidently, so long as they don't call me what they used to call me at school. Ralph was faintly interested. Uh, what was that? The fat boy glanced over his shoulder, then leaned towards Ralph. He whispered, they used to call me Piggy. Ralph shrieked with laughter. He jumped up. Piggy, Piggy, Ralph, please. Piggy clasped his hands in apprehension. I said I didn't want Piggy, Piggy. Ralph danced out into the hot air of the beach and then returned his fighter plane with wings swept back <clears throat> and machine gun Piggy. <laughs> he dived in the sand at Piggy's feet and lay there laughing. Piggy! Piggy grinned reluctantly, pleased despite himself at even this much recognition. So long as you don't tell the others. Ralph giggled into the sand. The expression of pain and concentration returned to Piggy's face. Half a sec. He hastened back into the forest. Ralph stood up and trotted along to the right. Here the beach was interrupted abruptly by the square motif of the landscape. A great platform of pink granite thrust up uncompromisingly through forest and terrace and sand and lagoon to make a raised jetty four feet high. The top of this was covered with a thin layer of soil and coarse grass and shaded with young palm trees. There was not enough soil for them to grow to any height, and when they reached perhaps 20 feet, they fell and dried, forming a crisscross pattern of trunks very convenient to sit on. The palms that still stood made a green roof, covered on the underside with a qu quivering tangle of reflections from the lagoon. Ralph hauled himself onto this platform, noted the coolness and shade, shut one eye, and decided that the shadows of his body were really green. He picked his way to the seaward edge of the platform and stood looking down to the water. It was clear to the bottom and bright with the efflorescence of tropical weed and coral. A school of tiny glittering fish flicked hither and thither. Ralph spoke to himself, sounding the bass strings of delight. What's that? Beyond the platform, there was more enchantment. Some act of God, a typhoon perhaps, or the storm that had accompanied his own arrival, had banked sand inside the lagoon so that there was a long, deep pool in the beach with a high ledge of pink granite at the further end. Ralph had been deceived before, now by the spacious appearance of the depth in a beach pool, and he approached this one preparing to be disappointed. But the island ran true to form, and the incredible pool, which clearly was only invaded by the sea at high tide, was so deep at one end as to be dark green. Ralph inspected the whole 30 yards carefully and then plunged in. The water was warmer than his blood and he might have been swimming in a huge bath. Piggy appeared again, sat on the rocky ledge and watched Ralph's, Ralph's green and white body enviously. You can't half swim. Piggy. 
Piggy took off his shoes and socks, ranged them carefully on the ledge, and tested the water with one toe. It's hot. What did you expect? I didn't expect nothing. My auntie sucks to your auntie. Ralph did a surface dive and swam underwater with his eyes open. The sandy edge of the pool loomed up like a hillside. He turned over, holding his nose, and a golden light danced and shattered just over his face. Piggy was looking determined and began to take off his shorts. Presently, he was palely and fatly naked. He tiptoed down the sandy side of the pool and sat there up to his neck in water, smiling proudly at Ralph. Aren't you going to swim? Piggy shook his head. I can't swim. I wasn't allowed. My asthma. Sucks to your asthma, Arl. Piggy bore his, this with a sort of humble patience. Hmm. You can't half swim well. Ralph paddled backwards down the slope, immersed his mouth, and blew a jet of water into the air. Then he lifted his chin and spoke. I could swim when I was five. Daddy taught me. He's a commander in the Navy. When he gets leave, he'll come and rescue us. What's your father? Piggy flushed suddenly. My dad's dead, he said quickly, and my mom. He took off his glasses and looked vainly for something which, with which to clean them. I used to live with my auntie. She kept a sweet shop. I used to go get ever so many sweets, as many as I liked. When will your dad rescue us? Soon as he can. Piggy rose dripping from the water and stood naked, cleaning his glasses with a sock. The only sound that reached them now through the heat of the morning was the long, grinding roar of the breakers on the reef. How does we know we're here? Ralph lolled in the water. Sleep enveloped him like the swathing mirages that were wrestling with the brilliance of the lagoon. How does he know we're here? Because, thought Ralph, because, because. The roar of the reef became very distant. They'd tell him at the airport. Piggy shook his head put on his flashing glasses and looked down at Ralph. Not them. Didn't you hear what the pilot said about the atom bomb? They're all dead. Ralph pulled himself out of the water, stood facing Piggy, and considered this unusual problem. Piggy persisted. This is an island, isn't it? I climbed a rock, said Ralph slowly, and I think this is an island. They're all dead, said Piggy, and this is an island. Nobody don't know we're here. Your dad don't know. Nobody don't know. His lips quivered and the spectacles were dimmed with mist. We may stay here till we die. With the word, the heat seemed to increase till it became a threatening weight and the lagoon attacked them with a blindful effulgence. Eff Get my clothes, muttered Ralph, along there. He trotted through the sand and during the sun's en enemy, en enmity, crossed the platform and found his scattering scattered clothes to put on a gray shirt once more was strangely pleasing then he climbed the edge of the platform and sat in the green shade on a convenient trunk piggy hauled himself up carrying most of his clothes under his arm then he sat carefully on a fallen trunk near the little cliff that fronted the lagoon and the tangled reflections quivered over him presently he spoke we got to find the others we got to do something ralph said nothing there was a coral island, protected from the sun. Ignoring Piggy's ill-omened talk, he dreamed pleasantly. Piggy insisted. How many of us are there? Ralph came forward and stood by Piggy. I don't know. Here and there, little breezes crept over the polished waters beneath the haze of heat. When these breezes reached the platforms, the palm fronds would whisper so that spots of blurred sunlight slid over their bodies to move, <clears throat> to move bright winged things in the shade. Piggy looked up at, up at Ralph. All the shadows on Ralph's face were reversed, green above, bright below from his lagoon. A blur of sunlight was crawling across his hair. We got to do something. Ralph looked through him. Here, at least, was the imagined but never fully realized place leaping into real life. Ralph's lips parted in a delighted smile, and Piggy, taking the smile to himself as a mark of recognition, laughed with pleasure. If it really is an island... What's that? Ralph had stopped smiling and was pointing into the lagoon. Something creamy lay among the ferny weeds. A stone. No, a shell. Suddenly, Piggy was a bubble with decorous excitement. That's right, it's a shell. I see one like that before, on someone's back wall. A conch, he called it. He used to blow it, and then his mom would come. It's ever so valuable. Near to Ralph's elbow, a palm sapling leaned out over the lagoon. 
Indeed, the weight was already pulling a lump from the poor soil, and soon it would fall. He tore out the stem and began to poke about in the water, while a brilliant flish, fish flicked away on this side and that. Piggy leaned dangerously. Careful, you'll break it. Shut up. Ralph spoke absently. The shell was interesting and pretty and worthy plaything, but the vivid phantoms of his daydream still interposed between him and Piggy, who in this context was an irre irrelevance. The palm sapling bending pushed the shell across the weeds. Ralph used one hand as a fulcrum and pressed down with the other till the shell rose, dripping, and Piggy could make a grab. Now the shell was no longer a thing seen, but not to be touched. Ralph too became excited. Piggy babbled, a conch, ever, a conch, ever so expensive. I bet if you wanted to buy one, you'd have to pay pounds and pounds and pounds. He had it on his garden wall, and my auntie, Ralph took the shell from Piggy, and a little water ran down his arm. In color, the shell was deep cream, touched here and there with fading pink. Between the point worn away into a little hole and the pink lips of the mouth lay 18 inches of shell with a slight spiral twist and covered with a delicate embossed pattern. Ralph shook out the sand from the deep tube. Mood like a cow, he said. He had some white stones, too, and a birdcage with a green parrot. He didn't blow the white stones, of course, and he said... Piggy paused for breath and stroked the glistening thing that lay in Ralph's hands. Ralph, Ralph looked up. We can use this to call the others, have a meeting. They'll come when they hear us, he beamed at Ralph. That was what you meant, didn't you? That's why you got the conch out of the water. Ralph pushed back his fair hair. How did your friend blow the conch? He sat. He kind of spat, said Piggy. My auntie wouldn't let me blow on account of my asthma. He said you blew from down here. Piggy laid a hand on his jutting abdomen. You try, Ralph. You'll call the others. Doubtfully, Ralph laid the small end of the shell against his mouth and blew. There came a rushing sound from his mouth, but nothing more. Ralph wiped the salt water off his lips and tried again, but the shell remained silent. He kind of spat. Ralph pursed his lips, squirted air into the shell, which emitted a low farty noise. <laughs> this amused both boys so much that Ralph went on squirting for some minutes between bouts of laughter. He blew from down here. Ralph grasped the idea and hit the shell with air from his diaphragm. Immediately the thing sounded. A deep, harsh note boomed under the palms, spread through the intricacies of forest, and echoed back from the pink granite of the mountain. Clouds of birds rose from the treetops, and something squealed and ran in the undergrowth. Ralph took the shell away from his lips. Gosh! His ordinary voice sounded like a whisper after the harsh note of the conch. He laid the conch against his hip lips, took a deep breath, and blew once more. The note boomed again, and then at this firmer pressure, the note, fluking up an octave, became a strident blare, more penetrating than before. Piggy was shouting something, his face pleased, his glasses flashing, the birds cried, small animals scuttered, Ralph's breath failed, the rote dropped the octave, it became a low wubber, was a rush of air. The conch was silent, a gleaming tusk, Ralph's face was dark with breathlessness, and air over the island was full of bird clamor and echoes ringing. I bet you can hear that for miles. So that was the majority of the first chapter, and I could read forever, but I've already put this entire audiobook on Clever and a link right next to the text. If you enjoy it and you want to hear someone read it, then absolutely follow along. That counts. It totally counts. I listen to audiobooks all the time and I have a degree in this stuff. But I want you to consider the things we talked about earlier regarding theme and central idea. Now a reminder, the central idea is what literally happens in the story, it's also known as the main idea, but the theme is what the author's telling you between the lines. So how does this story change when you change the setting from an island to a schoolyard, or an island to New York City? How does the story change when you take Ralph, now that we know he's so charismatic and a natural leader, and take him out and just leave Piggy, the anxious, kind of nervous, asthmatic nerd? How does the story change if all of a sudden it wasn't from a plane wreck, but they're just on vacation? Why would the author choose these things? That's how he's forming the theme. He wants you to get something between the lines. How can you do that in your own writing? 
Maybe you change a character to a familiar character from one of your other favorite stories. Or you might want to change the setting in a story you're currently writing to something else a little more exciting. Or you might want to make it something boring so that we focus on the characters in the plot. All these decisions are up to you when you are the author. So the fun thing to do as a reader is to analyze why they did it in their own work. If you have any specific thoughts about it and you want to discuss it with me, go ahead, shoot me an email, or you can leave it as a document on ManageBack. But regardless if you decide to keep reading this book or read something else, I do want you to read for 20 to 30 minutes a day. And as always, have a great day. <laughs>